Welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from the Frontier. Trust the week's gone well. Um, it always whizzes by, doesn't it? Let me start with thanking Emma Wade-Smith and the British High Commissioner Nick Haley. Um, it was a pleasure making her acquaintance uh, yesterday um, at the Embassy residence. And uh, there was this tremendous uh, show of force you had all the um, ambassadors in the region, from Addis to um, uh, Asmara, from Dar es Salaam to uh, Kampala. You had um, you know, the DFID representatives for those areas. You had the military attaches, defense attaches. I met a lady who was a Crown Prosecution Service. Uh, uh, it was really fascinating and lots of deep detail. Um, so thank you, and uh, I wish Emma the best. She's extremely charming down in Johannesburg. She's the first trade appointee for Africa, and uh, really sounded excited by the role. The Ethiopian High Commissioner was also very interesting. Uh, it was just fascinating, tensing as well. So thank you to Nick for that, and to Hannah. Macro thoughts, Donald Trump is the perfect scapegoat for Mercedes. I couldn't resist this photograph. Home thoughts, if you get up in the morning and think the future is going to be better, it is a bright day. Otherwise, it's not. I can't stress the importance of that, which was said by Elon Musk. <laughs> and I saw it via Lee Nike from South Africa. If you get up in the morning and think the future is going to be better, it is a bright day. Otherwise, it's not. 100%. I was speaking to my eldest daughter in London and saying, did you know it's the summer solstice? That was last night, the day of longest sunlight. It's the what was the word of the day yesterday, or words, the day of longest sunlight, the moment when the sun reaches its furthest point from the equator and seems briefly static in the sky. One of the year's two true turns from the Latin solstitium Sol, sun, and sistere to stand still. This was a lovely photograph from We Are Wilderness, classic Hawange moments. Uh, beautiful photograph. Uh, this is a photograph of the impressive city of Nairobi, standing tall at night by Tinse, by Kenya Pigs. And uh, that sort of triggered my thoughts. Nairobi has been so misty in the mornings of late, except for today where the sun has come out. The weather has not been like this for decades, like it was in my childhood when Nairobi was always cold, the smell of wood smoke always sat somewhere in the air. And because of the altitude, it always feels colder than it says on the dial. I tend to ask, well, what is the temperature? And everyone has a smartphone and Hannah kind of owns her mother's. And Hannah will say 16 or even 19. And I go, no way. Feels like it's in single digits. Hannah, of course, has been working very hard and at her computer. And I lay down on the bed and said, don't mind me. I'm like Bruno, who's a golden retriever and very, very loving. And I just want to lie here looking at you, like Bruno. Of course, I started with the season, and that took me back to John Keats, whose poetry made a big impression on me in my teenage years. To autumn. Seasons of mists and mellow fruitfulness, close bosom friend of the maturing sun, conspiring with him how to load and bless with fruit the vines that round the thatch eaves run, to bend with apples the mossed cottage trees, and fill all fruit with ripeness to the core, to swell the gourd and plump the hazel shells with a sweet kernel to set budding more, and still more, later flower, flowers for the bees until they think warm days will never cease. For summer has o'erbrimmed their clammy cells. Who hath not seen thee oft amid thy store? Sometimes whoever seeks abroad may find thee sitting careless on a granary floor, thy hair soft lifted by the winnowing wind, 
or on a half-reaped furrow sound asleep, drowsed with the fume of poppies, while thy hook spares the next swain and all its twined flowers. And sometimes, like a gleaner, thou dost keep steady thy laden head across a brook. Just kind of, you know, when you're in your teenage years, you discover your testosterone, and when you read that, <laughs> you can understand where he's coming from. I think it was about the same age. You died very young. You look at it, 1795, 1821, died at 26. I don't know what year he wrote that in. I suspect was in his late teenage years. Mount Poi, the Dodo Range of northern Kenya. This photograph is from Bobby Neptune. And then Joan, who I follow on Twitter and who lived here for many years, says, Oh, we have two degrees centigrade there one day, back when many parts of what was the northern frontier district was inaccessible. So there you go. We've had a cold snap like that one she's describing. I wonder what the temperature is up there. This bearbab still standing today was a shooting out post during World War One, British versus the Germans. Let's tie it to Vetter County, the Savo. This gentle giant was grazing right next to the Void Tiveta Highway, which cuts across Savo West National Park. So while traversing, you're on a game drive. We once counted 500 elephants uh, from the road. Did you know that giraffes only need 5 to 30 minutes of sleep in a 24-hour period? I didn't. The Big Bang made London Brexit could undo it. I must admit, you know, I was there and see the girls settled in because they're both working this summer. And uh, I did notice it was much weaker. And then when I went for that interview at Al Jazeera, I was talking to the taxi driver lady and uh, obviously she's correlated to the city and she said it's definitely slowed down and I think you know that's going to go deeper and stay stay like that for a bit longer than many people are predicting. Let's go to political reflections. Abby Ahmed, about whom I seem to have become a cheerleader, is the best example I can find of a Gladwellian level disruptor who is moving at the speed of light on the contemporary African continent. However, I still want to be short Rik Machar and Salva Kir because I really think they're a couple of donkeys where we don't get it blood on their hands. They just don't get it. However, uh, according to, uh, to a meeting between those two and with the Prime Minister of Ethiopia, peace is coming to our region, they all said. Well, here's to hoping in that particular scenario. That is some image the New Time cover. Have a look at this. And then this is marvellous, the Daily Show, with a little bit of a video, propaganda of Fox News, that's its North Korean state TV. And having watched a couple of these North Korean state TV productions, they are rather good, I must admit. And you would expect them to be good, given that the father, um, that was his real um, deep passion, was the cinema. And his sister, who manages propaganda, also seems to be a chip off the old block. The most practical man of business, John Maynard Keynes, wrote, might be the mental slave of a defunct economist. Sadly, the president appears to be the mental slave of a living one, namely White House trade advisor Peter Navarro. That's from Asia Times. And then uh, Jared Osoro, who's at the Kenya Bankers Association, said, Ken Kane saw Trump way back in 1936. The general theory, madmen in authority who hear voices in the air are distilling their frenzy from some academic scribbler of a few years back. And I said, brilliant, but this grand delusion can last for an eternity. Mrs. Trump wore a jacket to visit border kids that reads, I really don't care, do you? Her spokesperson confirmed Mrs. Trump wore such a jacket, I really don't care, do you? The spokesman said it's a jacket. There was no hidden message. After today's important visit to Texas, I hope the media isn't going to choose to focus on her wardrobe. And then Donald Trump 
tweeted, I really don't care do you, written on the back of Melania's jacket, refers to the fake news media. Melania has learned how dishonest they are, and she truly no longer cares. C.A.R. is known for civil war and anarchy, and like Mr. Becker, struggles to pay off its debts, says The Economist via Tristan McConnell. With this amount of present-day firepower, it is unsurprising that digital means and the consultants who profess to unlock their dark secrets are today taken as a game-changer in elections, writes The Daily Maverick. And if you've read my piece, The Deviate, then you'll know I tend to agree with that. Future technology, including virtual and augmented reality, looks set to influence further, making it imperative, apparently, to have its wizards on your side if you're going to win a democratic contest. Technology, of course, has not only affected the way we conduct commerce, but also the way we communicate. Technology, as Moore's Law illustrates, will continue to evolve and to change the way we do things. This is best indicated in contemporary terms by the impact of the fourth industrial revolution on manufacturing and by implication on the economies of countries and as a result of global politics. What makes a good message? The experience, this experience teaches is seldom based on a rational argument, but on a more prosaic sentiments of fear, hate, or hope. Moreover, the electorate want to hear stories that help to understand their circumstances and to present a clear message for the day after. Something, for example, that Hillary Clinton failed dismally to do. There is a warning in all of this. Even if the ability to target groups as Perakakis uh, has grown exponentially, the ability to generate messages has not. Technology may, in other words, make the difference between first and second, but if you have no political message that goes beyond dissing your opponent, nothing will ultimately save you, even if you do win. Let's move on to international markets. Leveraged loans are now yielding more than junk bonds, which is sort of strange, considering that they're supposedly higher up in the capital structure, meaning they'd get repaid first in an insolvency. So that's a little conundrum for you. Euro dollar, let's take a look at the currency markets, 116.61, dollar index 94.67, Japanese yen 110.15, Swiss franc 0 0.9900, the pound, that's the one that's really rallied sharply over the last two sessions, 132.92. Last, um, the Australian dollar, uh, 0.7416, India rupee 67.815, so that's improved a bit. South Korean won 11.0707, emerging markets you will see have had a little bit of a rebound. Brazilian real 3.7666, Egyptian pound 17.8755, South African rand 13.5120. So dollars selling off in the last, uh, I would say, uh, well since actually it, it became very marked. I think the trigger point was the uh, rebound in sterling on the 6-3 vote. Everybody was obviously very short. Dollar index, three-month chart. Um, I think it's softening up a little going forward. Now, euro dollar, strong rebound, 116.59. I still think we're going to 114.50, but it's probably got a little bit of energy. God, it's high as 118. The Bank of England left interest rates on hold at 0.5%, but the vote was narrower than ex expected. Sterling jumped almost a full cent to 132. Now it's at 132.93. Um, and uh, I think it was just more positioning. Ethereum billionaire, he looks remarkably relaxed, looks to China for next big crypto winners. Bitcoin's bad year may be getting worse as Bloomberg last trading at 6,510. And FSS is confident, this is in rebuttal to that University of Texas report, FSS is confident that Tether's unencumbered assets exceed the balance of fully backed dollar tethers in circulation as of June the 1st, 2018. Um, of course, University of Texas report from two Department of Finance, Finance academics, John Griffin and Amin Shams, set out to investigate whether Tether, a digital currency pegged to US dollars, influences Bitcoin and other cryptocurrency prices during the recent boom. 
They concluded that Tether followed market downturns and resulted in sizable increases in Bitcoin prices, correlation between Tether transactions and meteoric rises in the price of Bitcoin, wrote the academics, cannot be explained by investor demand proxies, but instead seem to indicate that Tether is being used to provide price support and manipulate cryptocurrency prices. Stuart Hogner, the general counsel for the Bitfinex crypto exchange that shares investor and management with Tether, told Reuters that these allegations of manipulation are completely misplaced. What is Bitcoin doing? Will the current 10-day pennant be? Peter L. Brandt tends to be very good at calling Bitcoin. He's asking, is it A, the bottom, B, part of the bottom, C, pause before the next downward storm? We shall find out soon enough. Gold, um, last at uh, 12.68. That's been quite soft. I would have thought it would start firming up from here, given that the dollar selling off crude oil uh, back above $66 at $66.16. And and that's put in a big recovery on OPEC, so let's see what comes out of that. Some key emerging markets about to run are about to run the gauntlet of potentially game-changing elections. A nice map for you to look at. 14th of May, I was worried about a crisis in emerging markets, and I said this is all the ingredients for baking a good old-fashioned crisis. Holger says, EM crisis spreads hungry foreign plunges to new all-time low versus the euro. Mexico raising key interest rate as peso weakness spurs inflation concerns. So two new reactions, but there are plenty of examples. Who gets hurt if China is embroiled in a trade war? Sometimes we're just too ahead of the game. When we first looked at this for all of EM, we only had 2015 trade data. This is from Redcap Man. And then he drills into Africa. In Africa, Zimbabwe looks a little bit more exposed than most, but more would be hit than this headline figure of commodities crumble, he says. Sub-Saharan Africa, the Italian ambassador in Algeria, Pasquale Ferrari, said that the Algerian army has deployed 80,000 troops on the southern borders of Mali and Niger, and the eastern borders of Libya. That's a huge number of people. We opened an office today in Rwanda. From Kigali, we will start managing projects and programs in Africa. So the story is set up. It's just a nice photograph of Kigali, which is a very clean city. Stop exploiting Africa, share resources, said the Pope uh, to Europe. Uh, we must invest in Africa, but invest in an orderly way and create employment, not to go there to exploit it, he told Reuters. When a country grants independence to an African country, it is from the ground up that the subsoil is not independent, and then people outside Africa can complain about hungry Africans coming here. There are injustices there. In DRC, the government has enacted a new mining code designed to earn extra money from the state for copper, cobalt, and gold. Pope said Europe needed to focus on education and investment in Africa if it wanted to stem the flow of migrants which is also an increasingly divisive issue in Italy. And there's a problem, he added. We send people back to those who have sent them here. They end up in the jails of traffickers. Press dubbed this the $3 billion laugh. This is Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed and UAE's Crown Prince MBZ exchanging banter and nice teas over traditional coffee by Rashid Abdi. Le Monde states the delegation of Eritrea to Ethiopia will not make peace or delimit the border. Its mission will be to prepare the highly symbolic trip of Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed to Asmara. Interesting piece in global research, China is centralizing its levers of control over the Congo. The Western European sized state and form of battleground of the so-called African World War that killed an estimated 5 million people is once again on the edge of chaos as an incipient hybrid war rages along parts of its periphery, allegedly driven by an incumbent President Kabila's postponement of the planned December 2016 elections for logistical reasons that would have deprived some of the electorate of their democratic rights. The real reason, however, is that the West is very uncomfortable with the Congo's fast-moving and full-spectrum strategic partnership with China. 
that has allowed the People's Republic to gain control over the majority of the world's cobalt production and possibly pioneer a trans-African connectivity corridor between the continent's two coasts. This was explained in detail in the author's note, June 2016 analysis titled China versus the US, the struggle for Central Africa and the Congo, which also accurately predicted the contours of the country's developing conflict. China's motivation for transforming its economic levers of influence into one of political control is self-explanatory because it seeks to secure its presence in the strategic region of Katanga, where most of its mineral investments are concentrated, as well as where it has the greatest potential of combining the recently refurbished Benguela Railway in Angola with its Tazara counterpart in Tanzania and Zambia for streamlining a cross-continental bicoastal connectivity corridor. Given the developing hybrid war in the Congo, however, China has no direct means of protecting this priceless piece of Central African real estate and isn't yet ready to connect private military forces there for that purpose. Furthermore, doing so might be interpreted as exceptionally hostile because of the history that Katanga has of being exploited by mercenaries who attempted to sever this mineral-rich region from the state at the behest of their Western masters. We need to move from the arch armchair to the drawing board, President Ramaphosa. South African all share down 5.5% here today. To dollar versus Rand, the Rand a little bit of a recovery, 13.512, but boy, that sell-off was quite sharp. Egyptian pound, 17.8755. The Nigerian all shares down 0.24% here today. To the Ghana stock exchange is up 10.95% here today, having given up significant gains. A very interesting piece in Beyond Bricks, but you're going to have to read it. The link is on the rich wrap-ups. Using equities and Bitcoin to understand the Zimbabwean dollar. And it's very detailed and analytical and well worth reading. The Mukuju River site is the most advanced uranium project in Tanzania. Has measured and indicated resources of 36,000 tons of uranium and inferred resources of 10,000 tons. This is from the IAEA, um, saying Tanzania is planning to introduce nuclear power on the basis of the 2003 Atomic Energy Act, which authorizes the use of uranium to produce electricity. Ethiopians in the $80 billion economy apply for between 1,000. 1,200 new SIM cards daily. I had a conversation with the Treasury guy yesterday, writes Mohamed Walie. He asked why the 0.05% Robin Hood tax on mobile money transfer should bother anyone. Um, he reckons 250 shillings on 500,000 is insignificant. That is when it hit me that those who make policies for us don't get to do much impact analysis. This tax will damage big volumes, low margin businesses in the capital markets, the capital markets that we're trying to deepen so we can reduce reliance on banks for all our borrowing, so we can bring down interest rates. Fund managers transfer huge amounts of same cash multiple times for one transaction, e.g. transfer $2 billion to bank through custodian places on call as you wait to bid for bonds. If successful, bid transfer to custody account, custody transfer funds to CBK to pay for the bonds. Bonds rally, fund manager decides to sell same bonds, transfer funds from CBK account to custodian. Place money in bank on call, in total a minimum of five transfers, a robin with tax of 5 million shillings. No different from the shell of CGT tax on stocks. Bad idea from a desperate treasury. He's not wrong. This is, of course, in addition to the excise duty that will be paid on the bank charges on each transfer. That's multiple taxation on the same transfer, Sunil Sanger. March was the fourth straight month of falling lending to households on a year-to-year -year basis, down 0.7%. That's from Raman Yang. Um, Kijomba 045 says it's cartel nomics, that's the word. Nairobi all share turned marginally higher, was 0.59% down on the year, having tumbled 13.42% since a record high on April 5. NSE 20 is down 10.84%. Have a look at this interview I did with Remy Liu uh, of um, uh, 
the French Development Agency, and Rebecca Miano of Kenjen. Kenjen trades on trading P of 5.219, and the share of price is a serious value proposition in my view. Former CEO Nakamat faces investigation over loss of funds. Let's see where that goes. Loss of 18 billion shillings. And then uh, a very interesting piece in The Economist about elite private schools are booming in Kenya. There's all this excitement around uh, uh, M&A activity in that sector as well. The farmer from Kibwezi town in the country's south is planting and selling sisal, a source of fiber that roadside vendors and market traders use to make carrier bags. A kilo used to sell for 30 shillings, but now it can fetch up to 100 shillings since the plastic bags. That's one good outcome from that particular bag. Thank you for stopping by. Wishing you a tremendous weekend.